chapter 2 uh, tonight. Job chapter 2, verse 11. I just want to talk to you tonight about friends. You know, we all need friends. Uh, Job needed friends. We need friends. Uh, everybody needs friends. In Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. It says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temite, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naphite, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they had lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads, toward heaven. And so they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was great. I wonder tonight if you uh, appreciate friends, I mean good friends that you have. Uh, ones who, who stick close to you, ones who hear your comfort, hear, hear your complaints, you know, there to, to uplift you up when you need them most. That's what Job needed here. Uh, we had learned for the chapter 1 and chapter 2, going through all the trouble and all the turmoil that Job suffered, losing family, losing friends, losing, or, or losing possessions and all these things. Uh, but at the end of it, he had, Job, he had friends to come and comfort him. Uh, we often criticize him and give him a hard time. We say, well, Job's friends, they were miserable comforters and they were... They were, were Physicians of no value is what the Scripture called them. And, and, and yeah, that may be true. Job was going through a hard time, yet Job was suffering. Job was going through a hard time, no doubt about it. But yet, these were true friends. Uh, friends that came to his rescue. Friends that heard his cry and was there to comfort him. Uh, friends that will disregard everything else to come to your rescue, to uplift you, and spirit. There's a story in, in Charles Dickens. I don't know if you've ever read the book, A Tale of Two Cities or not. But in that book, there's, there's two characters. One guy, his name is Charles Darnay. I don't know if I said that right. Or, and Sidney Carton. Darnay, he's a Frenchman of sorts. And, and he gets into all kinds of trouble. And, and it comes to a point where they throw him into a dungeon. And, and they tell him the next day you want to face the guillotine. The other friend that he has there, Sidney Carton, he, he is a man who's a lawyer. He's come to the end of himself. Uh, he's lived a life, a, a reckless life, loose living, and uh, he's come to the conclusion, like, I mean, there, there's nothing very great about this life. And so he hears about his friend who's in, in the prison and that he's going to face the guillotine the next day. He, he says, well, I'm a lawyer. I want to go and pull some strings. And that's what he did, does. He goes and pulls some strings. Somehow or another, he gets into the prison. He goes down into the cellar where his friend is. And they exchange clothes. His friend there, uh, they exchange clothes and he walks away free. And the next morning, he walks up and faces the guillotine for his friend. Now, I don't have any friends that's going to go and face a guillotine for me. You know what I mean? Uh, you know... Maybe, I don't know, but probably not. There's only one friend that I know of who, who would go and die in my place. That's the friend Jesus Christ, a man who, who, who sticketh closer than a brother. He, he's done that for us. He tells us in John 15, 13, he says, There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I have people that I consider some, some pretty close friends. Yeah, we have acquaintances, we have... Uh, people that we know, people who, when you see them, you, you shake hands and, you, and you're cordial with them. But what about those true friends? And this morning we had uh, Cody and Brittany, my friends, they're Marines. And I remember when they first left Jacksonville, North Carolina, leaving the, the Marines and coming to Bible College and devoting their lives to serving the Lord. And they moved into the same uh, trailer park that we, that we were living in at the time. 
uh, Sarah and I, we were managing the trailer park, and, and, and they bought this trailer, and, and it was the, the, the bathroom and stuff, it was all a wreck. And so naturally, as a man who's got to manage the trailer park and these things, I had to go and come to his rescue, redo the whole bathroom. I've never done bathrooms, remodeling, and these things. But I was told that I had to do it, and so I went ahead and I got my hands dirty and did it. Three days uh, in this man's personal space after I would get off of work and after I get off of school and these things, go to his house, pull out all the equipment. I, I, it probably wasn't the right kind of equipment, but you make do what you would have, have to do sometimes. You know, sometimes you use a crescent wrench for a hammer, that, that sort of situation. Uh, but anyway, we made sure that we, we took care of this man, and through three days and three nights of his seeing my, my ugly face, uh, we became friends. Uh, why? Because we spent a lot of time together. And he's traveled many a times, forwards and backwards, to, to Sanford, to here now, and in many places, he'll call me up once in a while to send me a text message. He's a, he's a true friend. Yeah, we've been able to stay over at his house many times, got to know his kids personally. There's another friend that I have, Dustin Duke. Yeah, he came to my uh, wedding up in, in Rhode Island. Uh, had a good time. I mean, he driving all that way, I, I'm, I, it's not like I could give him a whole lot. I was broke. Uh, I don't know why Sarah married me. It wasn't for my money. But it, uh, anyway, he came up for my wedding. He, he came to my ordination, through Seth, through my ordination council. Uh, I have his name right there on a piece of paper. And, and through all these things, through thick and thin, he was always there for me. I can call him up. I can sit there and I can pray with him. And I, I, can, I can, just as much as he sharpens me, I can sharpen him. And there's been times where he tells me things that I don't want to hear. There's been times where he told me, you know, brother, you... You might want to consider going this direction instead of the direction you're going. But that's what a true friend does. And then I have Pastor Tim Daniels, who I call many a times. I look up to him sort of like a spiritual father to me. And I'll call him up, you know, Pastor Tim, you've been pastoring for over 25 years. I need some help. I'm getting new in this, this, this pastoring thing, and I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, can you give me some help for business meetings? Can you give me help for counseling? Can you give me help for... And every single time, it would just, just humbly, peaceably come to my rescue as a friend. Come and preach the Founder's Day for me. All these things. It would meet with me, talk with me. That's what a friend does. That's the friend we got to be. We must seek to be the right kind of friend. Job's friends here, they weren't just some ordinary people. When I get to reading through the book of Job, and then some of the things that Job did, he was a man who was constantly in the public eye. He would go and, and, and judge the people, the, the widows, the orphans, the fatherless, all these things, and he came and judged for a righteous judgment and tried to uplift the people and hear their cries and, and come to their rescue and all these things, but they're not the ones that Job, they're just called Job's friends here. Uh, they, Job came across many people daily. But who are his friends? They're the ones from the foreign countries far, far out there. The, the, the Temanite, the, the, the Shua, I can't even pronounce some of these words here. The Shuite, the Naamathite, coming from far places, coming to Job's rescue. And, and, and the Bible is the one that calls them his friends. The three friends of Job there in verse 11, uh, coming to his rescue. They know his dealings. They know his personal life. They, they know all about Job. And so let's look uh, at Job's friends here. What does it mean to be a friend? Uh, I don't normally do this, but I kind of put an acronym together, friend. Uh, one word for each letter there, friend. A friend is one who's familiar. When these three men came up to Job and they come looking afar off and they were looking for Job, they had heard all about what had happened to him. I'm sure news spread far and wide. But when they came up over the hills, they, they said that I didn't even recognize who Job was. The, the, the sores, the boils over all of his body. I mean, they, they didn't even recognize. He was so disfigured and so marred and all these things. But yet, they were familiar with him. A friend is a person who's well acquainted with you. This is more than a casual kind of familiar. 
a friend spends time with you and he's concerned about you, you he knows your birthdays, he knows your anniversaries, he knows your children's names. That's one thing that you know I've I try to encourage people to do. When we have missionaries on the back wall, we know the Ludwig's pretty good because they've been in church for a long time. But do you know the the children of all your missionaries back there? Do you know your missionaries? Would you know them if they showed up in church? Would you know their face if you seen them? Uh, they they have a part of our ministry in these things, and uh, but we need to we need to be acquainted with our friends. That's what it's all about here. It doesn't mean that you have to be around them every single day. I'm not around Dustin Duke every single day. I'm not around Pastor Tim Daniel every single day, but you know what? I can call him up at a moment's notice. We can pick up where we left off and, and, and it'll just be as, as great as it was when we left off. Sarah has one friend that she's had for a very long time. Uh, her name's Dacia. This is a friend, it's the only friend that she's had uh, before she got saved. And, and you've heard Sarah's testimony of how she had lived a kind of a rough lifestyle. Uh, that's what happens when you get saved later in life. There's many things you, you regret. But this is one lady uh, who Sarah knows personally. She, she knew her, she used to hang out with her, and she's out of the American Baptist Association and these things. So, needless to say, you know, she didn't witness to Sarah a whole lot. But yes, she would tell Sarah that she's saved, but they keep in constant contact. She sends Sarah some gifts once in a while. She sends them, sends cards in the mail, she sends pictures of her kids and these things. This is a, a friend, but it's a distant friend. It's not a close friend because they're not the same spiritually. They're at different places. Uh, they're, they're not as close as what they like to be, but we, every time we go up to Rhode Island, we try to go and stop by their house, witness to Dacia and John, and tell them, you know, this... It's what you need to do to get saved. And, and every time John will say, well, well, all religions are, are, are good, right? Every single time I was like, you, know, you need to accept Jesus Christ. It's not about the religion. It's about a relationship. It's about having a relationship with your Lord. That's what I'm talking about. A familiar, familiar person right here. Sarah has another friend she's super close with. Her name is, it used to be Brooke Passarelli. Now it's Brooke uh, Schmidt. She got married. And I'm sure those two, if you'd ask them, they know more about each other than probably what their parents know about them. And they, they talk constantly in and out. I mean, they were at each other's wedding. She was in our wedding. We were at her wedding. They liked the same things. She's from Connecticut. Sarah's from Rhode Island. They have a lot in common. And they're constantly talking and spending time together and sharpening one another. They're very familiar. I believe that's the way Jesus was with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And even the people that looked out when Jesus showed up at the, at the funeral site of Lazarus and He told them to remove the stone. And they looked at Jesus and they looked at the tears and how He wept and they said, Behold, how He loved Him. That's what a friend does. He loves his friends at all times. There's never a point where He doesn't love them. There's never a point where He won't come to the rescue. And they're very familiar. I'm sure He sat at their dinner table many a, many a time. Had constant and sweet fellowship, constantly... Uh, reaching out and, and ministering one to another, whether it's through uh, physical sustenance or, or you know, fellowship, breaking bread, or whatever the case may be. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Sometimes we forget that. If I want to be a friend to any of you, i got to show myself friendly. I can't brush people off. I can't say that I don't have time for you. It's none of that stuff. You must show yourself friendly and always be there as a friend. You must be reliable. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Job's going through adversity, is he not? And facing some of the biggest trials that he's ever faced in his life, and, and he's going through the thick of it, and and no matter what, he knows that he can rely upon his friends to be there. No matter what happens, his friends is going to come. He's going to show up when they hear about the news. Do you remember about David and Jonathan in the Old Testament? How it says that the Bible says that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul and how they made a covenant together. And do you remember how... Jonathan, even despite his father there, Saul, 
he would go and intercede for David and, 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 and Saul, he was jealous. Saul was, was uh, completely against David for, for whatever reason, just jealousy, just envy, just bitterness that was welled up and, and Jonathan would intervene between him and his father, between David and his father. And we come and, and try to see David's well-being. Try to make sure that he was there to intercede and take care for him. And do you remember David showing kindness to the house of Jonathan by accepting Mephibosheth and to his household? A man who was uh, lame on his feet, didn't have anything to offer, nothing to contribute to the kingdom and these things, but he yet showed kindness to Mephibosheth on account of Jonathan and the covenant they made together. Didn't forget it. He constantly reliable in life and in death. He was always there looking out for one another's kid. I remember being in the Virginia Army National Guard, Sergeant Post. It's a man who always had everything and uh, I kind of looked up to him. He had his daughter there and me and her, we worked together at Sears in the automotive shop working on vehicles together. And because I respected Sergeant Post so much and I cared about him, you know, I'd constantly look out for his daughter, you know, making sure nobody's going to pick on her, make sure nobody's going to mess with her. I mean, she was a tough kid. I mean, I don't think any man was going to mess with her in the first place, but in case they did, I was going to come to the rescue. I was going to be reliable. I was going to stick up for my friend's daughter and stick up for his family because he, he was a man that stuck up for me at times when I was in the army. But you ought to be able to call up a friend with confidence knowing that he's going to be there for you no matter what. A friend will be a man who comes to the rescue even when he doesn't have a solution. That's the way it is sometimes. I'm coming, but I don't know if I have the answer to your problem. I'm coming, I'll help you out, but I don't know if it's going to be uh, much to your profit or not, but I want to be there. I want to show up at your doorpost. Uh, I'll give you what I can. He or she will not share your secrets. This is important, reliable. He's not going to share your secrets with the soul unless it's a matter of something that the authorities need to know about. He's not going to go and spread your business around town. What's between you and your friend sticks between you and your friend unless you know they say something like, oh, well, I've been cutting myself. Well, that person needs help. Unless it's something that the authorities need to know about, they've broken the law, then it's important that you go to the authorities. But you don't spread secrets about somebody. You don't go out and be a talebearer. You don't uh, deceive somebody in thinking that you're a, a good friend when you spread those secrets. Then they're invested. They're familiar, they're reliable, they're invested. We know about investments, don't we? spending our money in the stock markets and putting it in there. We invest ourselves in a company. We invest ourselves in a church. We invest ourselves in many different areas. But if you invest something, you're putting your money, you're putting your, your, your reputation at stake in these things. You, you, you're completely all in. And if you want to put your money in there, you want to see a profit. You want to see it grow. You want to see it uh, do good and be edified. That's what you want to do with your friends. We're not to lose in the relationship. We're to build them up. You're to profit them. You're to encourage them. You're to, you're to be there by their aid no matter what. Whether it's, uh, it's through money or, or whatever. So they're familiar, reliable, invested, and edifying. Proverbs 27:17 says, Iron sharper than iron, so a man sharper than the countenance of his friends. I don't know if you've ever tried to cut something with a dull pair of scissors or children's scissors, but it doesn't work too well. I don't know if you've ever been out splitting wood with a dull axe, but, you know, it's, it's hard on your energy. And you're not going to cut too much wood. We need to constantly be out there being sharp, sharpening others and honing it in so we can accomplish something, so it doesn't lead to frustration. Basketball players and football players, how do they win? their games, their practice. They go out there and they'll work hard and they'll watch the, the, the different strategies of the other teams. They'll see their weaknesses and, and together they, they, they become knit together knowing what somebody else is going to do. They know that if they pass the ball to one end of the court that, that teammate is going to be there 
because they've practiced, they've sharpened, they've honed their skills. That's what we got to do. We got to uh, anticipate, we got to know, we got to be so acquainted with a friend that we know how to help them out, to sharpen them. Because iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. The Bible says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? That's what a dull scissors would do for you. That's what a, a dull axe would do for you. You get nowhere. It, it's just no profit. We need to be in the Word, going in the same direction. Don't be unequally yoked, as I'd say. At the same time, we're, we're to walk together. We're to be building up good habits and good traits. And they're also there to point out our flaws, too. When you're there, you're edifying, you're building up. Not only you are you sharpening one another, but you're also there as a friend, like I said about my friend Dustin, who, who points out some of my flaws that I don't like sometimes, but it's there. I know he means for my, well, my well-being. Just Sarah sometimes, she'll say, you know, maybe you should consider doing this, or maybe you should consider, not that I'm telling you what to do. Well, that's what a good friend does. They help you, even when you don't want to hear it. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faith for the wounds of a friend. I want a friend to tell me the truth even if it hurts. Too many people are quick to give you a pat on the back, but a true friend is honest. It is honesty and love. Not being honest to be hard, not honest to put down somebody else, but being honest and love and then near to God. And Jesus said that there is only two paths, a narrow way, and the broad way. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter ye in at straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and there many there be which go in thereat. You know, I don't want to be the one who leads somebody else to destruction. I don't want to be going the path of the broad way. I want to be going to the path of the narrow way. The one that leads to life, not the one that leads to destruction. You're not a true friend if you're leading people to the path of destruction. One that's not going to profit and one that's not going to uh, give them a, a, a good life. One that's not going to encourage, one that's not going to edify. You, you want to, to build them up in the right way. Bring them near to God because that's what they need. Uh, showing them that grace and that truth that we talked about this morning. So a true friend is not going to lead you to destruction, but he wants to help you, not hurt you. But one, some things that I consider here is, what is his or her reputation? When I think about somebody who's near to God, what's their reputation like? Is it one that I know that's going to push me close to God, or is it one that's going to pull me away from God? What does their reputation tell me that they're going to do? And then what are their interests? Uh, I know some people are so consumed in other things, watching TV and video games, they're not concerned about you. They're not concerned about God. They're not concerned about the things of God. But if you want a true friend, you want to find one who is concerned about the things of God and does have a good reputation. And then discern, discerning. A true friend knows if something's going to happen in your life, They're able to discern your actions, your mood, your tone of voice, and depending on that, they'll know if you're okay or not. That's what Job's friends did here. They, the Bible says that they planned. They made an appointment. They went to, to see Job. It says, Now when Job's three friends had heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came, every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temite, Bildad the Shuite, Zophar the name of Thypher, they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. I'm sure Job's friends there, they were making this appointment. They heard all the things that come to pass. Things like this doesn't happen without somebody knowing about it. Job was a wealthy man. He had possessions. He had camels. He had uh, donkeys. He had the whole nine yards. He had servants. He had men servants. He had maid servants. He had children. He had all these things. You, you don't think something like this is going to happen and, and Job's friends are not going to hear about it? They're going to hear about it. This is going to get around town and they're going to be talking about it and they're going to say, man, did you hear what happened to Job? Did you hear what, that, that he lost all of his kids? Did you hear that he lost all of his possessions and all? all? I think God cursed him. I think he was 
messing around in sin, and, and this this was going on as judgment against them. And I'm sure rumors got spreading around, and they were talking about him. And eventually, those rumors got around to his friends, and they say, "Well, I know Job. I'm not going to judge him. Job's not that kind of man." And they get together. The three friends are heard about it. And it got got around town, and they come together. And, and it's not like these days that they got a cell phone. But somehow or another, they got the news out, and they said, "Man, we get we got to get together. We got to go see Job. Man, their, their their life is falling to pieces. Things is not going their way. They're in trouble. They're in turmoil, and all these things. We need to get together. We need to make an appointment. We got to come to their rescue. Uh, you, when somebody's going through a heartache and something like this, uh, a death." that's in the family when, they're, when they've lost everything. It's not like you just go and knock on their door at a moment's notice. No, you, you, you come, you be considerate. You, you talk to them. You say, hey, Job, we want to come to your rescue. We, we want to encourage you. We want to help mourn with you. We want to be an encouragement to you. That's what we want to do. Job, is there a time where we can come and do that? Is there a time where we can come and spend time with you? Is there any time like that? And so they make this appointment. They all get together, all three friends. They said, you know, we want to gather all of our friends. We want to surround them with as much love as we can. And they make an appointment to go spend with Joe. And they don't only make an appointment. They, they get together. They say, this is what we're going to do. We're, we're not just going to come together just, to, just for our own good. We're going to make a plan. We're, what we're going to do, we're going to come together. We're going to mourn with Job. We're going to comfort Job. We're going to come to his rescue. That's what we're going to do. You know, I want somebody who's going to be sensitive enough to mourn with me if I'm going through that situation. I want somebody who's going to be able to be there. And, and you know, I, I am a man. I don't always like to cry. You know what I mean? But I want somebody who's going to let me cry with them in private. That sort of situation. I want somebody who's going to come by and and just comfort me and tell me that everything's going to be okay. That God is still there and that God is still real. I talk about that a lot, but that's what I want you to know. And so they come to His rescue and, and they're there to encourage and help and build Him up. And they make some plans. They, they probably bring some flowers maybe. Maybe they'll bring some food with, along with them. Maybe they'll bring a little bit of finances with them and say, You know what, Job, do you need any money? Man, you lost everything. Surely you need some money. Surely you and your wife need a break. We, we'll, we'll bring you some food over. Surely, surely we can help you out. Maybe bring you some flowers or whatever the case may be. But we want to come to your rescue. You know, we don't only do that uh, today, but they did it back then as well. To come along one another and to help them. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Be in Romans 12, verse 12. We have a responsibility not only as friends, but as in brotherly love to take care of one another. In Romans 12, uh, verse 12 down through 16, it says this. It says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. You know, they, they said, we, this is how we want to comfort them. We want to go mourn with them that warm, mourn and weep with them that weep. Rejoice with them that rejoice. That's what a friend does. And so they not only plan, but they, they're perceived uh, uh, when they went and saw Job here. So they physically saw, when they lifted up their eyes afar off, they knew him not. And Job was going through it so bad, his friends didn't recognize him. He, he didn't look like himself. God had purposed to, uh, in giving a sight for a reason. The Bible tells us that the light of the body is the eye, and there, therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. 
And what you see, as it says in the book of Lamentations, should affect your heart. He says, Mine eye affected my heart for the children of Israel. And in the book of Lamentations, what was happening was the children are sent to so bad that God says punishment's coming. And when Job, when, when Jeremiah seen all the punishment and all the desolation, when he seen the walls tore down, when he seen everything, just wiped out everything that he loved, all of his friends lost everything, all of the family were going through troubles. And, and these things, they were going into captivity, many people who he knew. And he says, my eye affected my heart, and he began to to weep and he began to cry out. This is what's going on here. They saw what was taking place. He saw the turmoil that they were going through and, and because of what they saw, they, it worked in them physically for the tears and then it worked in them emotionally and it affected their heart and it grieved them to the core. But one thing that I absolutely hate about, you know, these days is sometimes the things we see we become desensitized to. And the kids who are out there playing video games and these things and all the shooting games and, and, and whatever the case may be, watching TV and they think that that's reality and, and the next thing you know they, they try to impose what they've seen on TV and in the video games and, and try to apply it to real life and it doesn't work that way. They're desensitized. We can't become so desensitized to the things that affect us. Desensitized to what's happening to our friends. Desensitized to what's happening to our community. Like what he's talking about this morning. We need to be physically affected because of what we see. And then they were emotionally affected. They lifted up their voice and wept. And broke their hearts to see such a great and loving and just man in shambles because this wasn't supposed to happen in their theology. This wasn't supposed to happen in their reasoning. It wasn't supposed to happen in their thinking. Job was a just man. He was a perfect man. He was an upright. And this is not supposed to happen to somebody who has that reputation. I remember I told you about my sister Sherry who passed away. Sherry had passed away and I was unsaved at the time. And over a long period of time, this I would, since the time I was a teenager and on, from probably 12, 13, 14, I trained myself to such a way to where I, I became numb to my feelings. It's just like I didn't... It was almost like I, I don't know how to explain it to you, but I almost stopped feeling. And I got to the point here, and hearing about the news of my sister passing away and I was grieving on the inside but the tears weren't coming because I'd become so uh, hardened in my heart and, and understand I was a, a lost man and I, I loved my sister to death but the, the numbness that was going on and, and we went to the funeral homes and to the viewing and these things and you hear all the people saying oh I'm so sorry and oh this and oh that and all, all the other but no man would come up to me and put their arms around me and, and say, you know, I know that you're suffering. I know what you're going through. They didn't come up to me when they see me sitting in the back all by myself and, 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 and try to encourage me and say, I know you must be hurting. This is your sister. I know you must be going through, through something hard. We need to sit down and talk. We need to spend some time together. Nobody who, who knew the gospel came and talked to me. The preacher who got up and preached, I don't even remember what he preached on. It was just a, a, a blackness. I, I don't even remember, really. All I remember is uh, my sister, her, her mother. She's my half-sister. Uh, the last thing I remember about the whole situation was when they put her in the ground, she, she had to take that shovel of dirt. I, I would never do this to somebody. She had to take that shovel of dirt and throw on her own daughter's grave and seeing the cries and all this. We need to learn how to cry with people. When they're emotionally hurt and when they're weeping, I needed somebody at that time to weep with me. I needed somebody at that time to share Jesus with me. I needed somebody... That's the most sensitive time that anybody can ever hear the gospel. That's what I needed at that time. But they broke spiritually. 
They rent everyone his mantle and sprinkle dust upon their heads toward heaven. And this reached past their emotions. It reached past the physical and it reached their very own souls. And for seven days they couldn't say a word. Then they partook. They partook in Job's humility. These guys were probably wealthy men like Job himself, and maybe not to his extent. They were not thinking about their positions. They weren't thinking about uh, what other people might think when they see him. They weren't thinking about uh, those who were talking in the town and all the rumors are going on. They, they didn't care about all of that. They said, this is my friend Job. I want to condescend down to his lowest state. I want to humble myself like unto him. I want to come and be as he is and come to his rescue. I want to come in comfort. I want to come in mourn with him. I want to come in humility. Sitting down. I, I don't care about my possessions. I don't care about my wealth. I don't, I'm going to sit down in the dust. I want to rent my mantle. Sprinkle that dust on their heads. They were humble. It's not right for you to leave your friends high and dry when something tragic happens because of what it might cost you. A friend's supposed to love at all times, Proverbs 17, 17. To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friends. That's what it says in Job 16, 6, 14. Him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friends. They partook in Job's heart. I guess none spake a word for him, for they saw that his grief was great. You know, the Bible tells us there's a time to be silent. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to weep. There's a time to cast away. And there's a time to build up. That's what they're doing here. And for them, it was a time to be silent. They were there to come and alleviate the sorrows of Job. But when it came down to the situation, they said, it is so bad, it's so tragic. When we see Job and we see all, all, all how this, this, this tragedy has affected his whole body, has affected him mentally, has affected him spiritually, in every sort of way, I don't even know what to say. I don't know any encouraging words. I don't have it within me to, to, to help it build you up as a friend. And the best thing that I can do, I don't want to speak anything foolishly, is just keep my mouth quiet. In fact, Job was the very first one to express his sorrow. But these guys were heartbroken just like Job was. The Bible says the heart of the wise studies the answer, but like I said, they didn't have a word to answer. But what they did is what a true friend should do. They paid attention. They listened. A lot of times we like to speak. We, we say a lot of things. Uh, that's the most important thing we can do at a funeral or any other situation. It's not that we need to speak all the time. We're so quick to, to speak something out. But a lot of times I've found just being married for four, a little over four years, a lot of times what my wife wants me to do is, is not all the time speak, is I just need to listen a lot of times. Uh, she wants me to hear what she's going through. She says, you don't have to say anything. I just need somebody to talk to. This is what they're going through. He just needed somebody to listen to Job's complaints. If we look in Job chapter 3, the things that he's, he's suffering from, the things that he says, he says, uh, after this opened Job his mouth and he cursed his day and Job spake and said, let the day perish wherein I was born. And he begins to speak all these things that has affected him. He says, this is the worst thing in the world that could happen to me. I wish I wasn't born. I wish I wasn't on this earth. And, and though we say, well, Job should never say that. Well, if you were in that situation, you'd probably say the same thing. But the important thing is a friend. We need to be listeners listening to what they're going through. Helping them by listening. And that's why somebody said that God gave us two ears and one mouth. And then they loved A middle school teacher asked her class to write imaginative definitions of a friend and these were the descriptions she received. It says, one person said, A friend is a pair of open arms in a society of armless people. Another said, A friend is a warm bedroll on a cold and frosty night. Another one said, A friend is a mug of hot coffee on a damp, cloudy day. That's, that's my definition right there. A friend is a beautiful orchard in the midst of the desert. A friend is a hot bath after you've walked 20 miles on a dusty road. 
And you know what? We can describe a friend in a hundred different ways, but there's no better way to describe a friend than a man who loves. Sometimes we think that Job's friends were judgmental and that they were unloving and weren't caring. They, they, they did what I told you that friends do. They were confronting. They thought that Job had sinned. They said, Job, if you sin, this is the time to get right. This is the time to, to confess your sins and make all things right before God. They didn't know if that was the case or not. They just supposed that it was. They weren't judging Job. They were loving him. They were trying to draw him close unto God. They're, they're uh, presuppositions were wrong. You know. But they didn't they didn't give up on Job. Through all the discourses in in out and, and some of the things that, that Eliphaz said, some of the things that Bildad says, some of the things that uh, that all the rest of them says, I would have just packed my bag and said, you know what, I'm done. But they sat through it. I mean, he kept on, kept keeping on. I mean, they, they sat there and they wanted to keep on encouraged. They didn't leave. But they stood by him. They stood by him through it all. Sometimes a friend might insult you or push you away, but that's probably the time that they need you the most. And uh, you know what? I'm no expert on friendships. I'm not. I know what the Bible says about friendships. I know I lack many a times on what it means to be a friend. But what I want to ask you and what I want to ask me is, are you the friend that you're supposed to be? Are you familiar? Are you reliable? Are you invested? Are you uh, edifying, near to God? Are you discerning? Do you have the character of Joe's friends who who are coming and, and, and laying everything to the side and saying, you know what, we want to come and comfort and, and help mourn and do all these things. Are you that kind of friend to come to the rescue when your friends need you the most, when they're going through troubles and trials? Is that you? Do you have the character of Job's friends to stick around in the good times and the bad? That's what I have for you tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and mercy and your goodness to us, Lord. You're that friend that sticketh closer to the brother. Lord, I thank you for the gospel that came down uh, to come and in a dark time of my life that you came and saved my soul. We thank you for that. We thank you for being a friend to us when we didn't deserve it. We thank you for the friends that we have here on this earth and pray that, Lord, you help us to be better friends in our relationships. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, I do want to ask you this, and do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know that heaven's your home for sure? It starts out with the fact of acknowledging that we've, we've all sinned and we've all gone astray and we all fell short of God's glory. But yet God gave His Son to die on the cross for your sins and mine. Has there ever been a time where you've accepted that payment for your sins? If you were lost and undone without Christ, and you want to come and be saved today, would you raise your hand?